Good evening, church family. It's been a wonderful day. I hope you also have had a wonderful day. And I certainly enjoyed our time together this morning to worship God in spirit and in truth and to study from His Word. I am appreciative for your presence here this evening, and I am thankful for your interest in spiritual matters. I just want to remind you that this morning we begun to discuss the idea of being in Christ and how that there are so many blessings that are in Christ. Actually, the Bible says in Ephesians 1, in verse number 3, that all or every spiritual blessing is located in Christ Jesus. And this morning, we looked at a few of those blessings. We, we discussed the idea how that there is redemption in Christ, the, the, the idea of belonging to Satan because of our choice to sin. And belonging to the and being in bondage to sin, and yet we needed rescuing, and we needed a payment to be made, and we needed to be bought back from the devil. And certainly in Christ, we have that wonderful blessing of redemption. We also talked about grace and how it's only found in Christ, and salvation and how it's only found in Christ. And we went on over to Romans 8 and verse number 1 and noticed how that as long as a person is in Christ, there is no possibility of condemnation. Now, I may choose to leave the circle of Christ. I may choose to walk away from Christ, thus forfeiting that blessing. I can indeed fall from grace. But as long as I'm walking in the light, 1 John 1 verse number 7, the blood of Jesus is continually cleansing me of my sins, keeping me in fellowship with God and with His children. We noticed this morning how that as long as a man or woman remains outside of Christ, they have no hope. And how that because of our sins, according to Isaiah 59 verse number 2, we have been separated from God. Therefore, as long as we're living in sin, we cannot be in fellowship with God. We cannot be in Christ. Therefore, we cannot enjoy all spiritual blessings as long as we are outside of Christ. And so, because of my sins, that, that's the reality that all mankind faces. But we also talked briefly about if I'm currently not in Christ, and I so desperately want to be in Christ where I can freely enjoy things like redemption and God's grace and salvation, and where I can have the confidence that as long as I'm in Christ, there will be no condemnation. If that's where I so desperately want to be, then the question is, how do I go from being outside of Christ to being in Christ. And yes, we talked about these passages this morning and we talked about baptism, but that's not the whole story, folks. In Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, yes, a person is to be baptized into Christ. That, that is, we are to put the old man of sin to death as it is nailed to the cross with our Lord and Savior. And, and just as Christ was buried, so we are buried in the waters of baptism. And just as Christ raised from the dead on the third day, so when we come forth from the waters of baptism, we uh, array, arise to walk in newness of life. And we talked about baptism under those circumstances this morning. And yes, that does put us in Christ. But it's that passage in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse number 13 that catches my attention. And in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse number 13, the Bible says that we have all been baptized into one body. Now, I find that interesting in light of our discussion because uh, according to Romans 6, if I want to go from being outside of Christ where there is no spiritual blessings to being in Christ where every spiritual blessing is located, I must be baptized into Christ. But according to 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, the same process means that I am baptized into the body of Christ. And so I make that observation just simply to say that according to Ephesians 4 and verse number 4, there is one body. And according to Ephesians 1, and 23, Christ is the head of the body, and it goes on to say, which is the church. And so I've never been super brilliant at mathematics, but I understand this much to be true, that, that if the body is the same as being in Christ, and the body and being in Christ is the same as the church that belongs to Christ, 
And if I'm baptized into Christ, Romans 6, and I'm baptized into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, then what the Bible is telling me is that I must be in Christ, I must be in the body of Christ, and I must be not in an earthly organization with this name, but I must be in the church that belongs to Jesus Christ if I am to receive spiritual blessings. That's unpopular to say, is it? And with that being said, I just have to make this observation that we live in a world today where there is denominations on every corner. Every community that I've ever been to, especially here in the South, you, we, we, we see church building after church building after church building. And as we noted this morning, those church buildings, the first thing we notice is that they are known by different names. And, and when we do a simple search, we learn that every Protestant denomination has been established at, by a man or a group of men less than 600 years ago. I find that startling. And what I am afraid of, brothers and sisters, is that the average churchgoer doesn't know the history of their own denomination. And by the way, I have friends in denominations. I grew up in a denomination. There's many good people in almost, in I assume, every denomination. And just because we're going to a denominational church doesn't alone make us a horrible person. That's not what we're saying. But if we're having a Bible discussion, there is not 20,000 churches that the Lord approves of. There is not a plurality of bodies that belong to Christ. There is not, well, you join the church of your choice and I'll join the church of my choice. We'll be called different things and worship different ways and believe different things and at the end of the day, we'll all go to the same heaven. Now, I would love because of the person that I naturally am to just say, that works for me. But I cannot ignore the fact that God's Word says, Ephesians 4, 4, there is one body. Church family, does your Bible still say that? And we have to teach that. And I understand, especially amongst preachers in my generation, I understand how unpopular that is to say. But, but, but if the promise I made you on day one is to speak where the Bible speaks and remain silent where the Bible is silent. And if the Bible says there is one body and the body is the church, therefore there is one church that is authorized by God Almighty. There is only one church that belongs to Jesus Christ. And Church of Christ, if it ever becomes a title, I believe it's lost its significance. It is not necessarily a title. It is more of a description. I believe we often take things in scriptures that are meant to be a description and use it as a title. The word bishop is a description. The word pastor is a description. The word overseer or shepherd is a description. It describes one's work. It isn't a title to wear. And so church is from the Greek word, as you well know, ekklesia, which means the called out body called out from sin and called out from the world. And, and the word of is a word that shows ownership. It belongs to. And the word Christ, of course, is referring to the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who died on the cross for our sins. And so instead of, claim, instead of trying to find salvation in a denominational church, what my Bible is telling me is that I must be in Christ, in the body of Christ, in the church, the called out group of people that belongs to Jesus Christ if I'm going to be where every spiritual blessing is found. During the days of the tenth plague, unless a person was in a house marked with the blood of a particular sacrificial lamb, then the plague would be pronounced upon each firstborn member of that home. Now, if the father was the firstborn and the mother was the firstborn, and then they had a firstborn, that could be three people dying all in one family. 
The protection from that tenth plague, if you will, was to be in the right location, not just a location, not just a home, not just a home with blood on the door, but the home with the blood of a particular lamb on the door, prepared in a certain way. And in the days of Noah, years earlier, of course, we understand that the people of Noah's day could only be saved and only receive the grace of God if they were in one location at a given time that was the ark that Noah had built. And so Noah, God gave salvation to the people of Noah's day only if they were in the ark when the floods came, right? And God gave salvation to the people of Goshen and, and Egypt during the days of the 10th plague only in the location where the blood was marked on the doorpost. And in the New Testament, I am told in 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 24, that when Jesus Christ comes again, He's coming to deliver His kingdom. That's another word for the, name, for the word church or body of Christ. He's coming to deliver His kingdom back to the Father. The ark was the vehicle of salvation. The home with the doorpost marked in blood was the vehicle for salvation. The body of Christ, the church that belongs to Christ, it is the vehicle of salvation. And, and that's what God's Word is telling us. And, and I want to be loving, but I want to be honest at the same time and say that brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, anyone listening over the internet, salvation cannot be found in a denominational man-made church. Is that what your Bible teaches? That's what my Bible teaches. And I love people enough to say that because we are leading people astray if we say otherwise. There was a time from 1941 to 1961, this is statistics, real statistics you can find in our history books, when the churches of Christ were the fastest growing religious organization in the entire America. And having known some preachers from that time, I have often asked them, Brother, what do you believe the difference is from 1941 to 1961 when the churches of Christ were the fastest growing religious organization in all of America to today when the growth rate of the average church of Christ is 0.8% growth? Now, this doesn't apply to every congregation, but if you stretch it out and average it out, that means every congregation on average is gaining one new member every 18 years. Isn't that sad? And I've often asked the older preachers, well, I cannot ignore this reality that I will add to their statements. Society has no doubt changed. People's acceptance to the gospel of Jesus Christ has no doubt changed different than today as it was at one time in the past. And yes, there are trends and there are shifts that take place. But by and large, what I'm hearing from preachers of that generation is that they were unapologetically preaching the truth without compromise more frequently than what we often see today. And somebody may rebuttal and say, Preacher, you preach that today, you're going to run people off. What? Run one person off every 18 years? I would rather be half the size of what we are and preach the truth than to abandon New Testament doctrine altogether and have thousands of people here in our assembly. Wouldn't you think so? I would rather lead one soul to heaven than a thousand souls to hell. And that's the importance of what we're discussing. The, the, the apostles of the New Testament said this, particularly Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 and verse number 12, There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. They're talking about the name of Jesus. Salvation cannot be found outside of Christ. Salvation cannot be found outside the body of Christ. That's what our Bible is telling us in these verses. Now, I'm going to draw my version of a church building, okay? And I'm going to put steps up to this church building. I want to make this observation before I, I go into the point, and that is that the church is not the building. We know that. If we've ever needed reminding of that, this COVID lockdown has told us this. When we couldn't be here and worship and gather for what I assume is about a two-month period, the Lake City Church of Christ was still the Lake City Church of Christ, right? Right? 
The church is the people. The church isn't the building. But I'm going to use this picture of a church building to represent being in Christ, the same as the circle, to represent being in the body of Christ or the church that belongs to Christ. And yes, baptism is important. And this is, this is the exact approach I take in one-on-one -on -one personal Bible studies. And, and here's what I often ask people. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse number 6, that without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And so it is impossible for me to be pleasing to God without faith. And of course, the word faith and the word belief is used as one and the same concept in the New Testament. And it simply means more than a mental acceptance. We talked about it way back in June when we first met the congregation here. That biblical faith is comprised of three components. Hearing God's Word, Romans 10, 17. Trusting God's Word, Hebrews 11, 7 and 8. And doing God's Word, James chapter 2, verse 26 and following. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen... It does us no good to be baptized if we are not being baptized from a heart of genuine faith. And when we go to Latin America, like I know some of you have, and, and the average person we talk to comes from the background of Catholicism where infant baptism is practiced very freely. It needs to be stated that, that, that we're, when we're talking about someone going from outside of Christ where no spiritual blessing is found to being in Christ where all spiritual blessings are found. Yes, baptism is important, but there are steps that lead to baptism, and the first of those steps is faith. Now, we we could include hearing, but I believe that's a given. And of course, when I'm studying with someone, I, I think it's important to point that out. And of course, repentance. And, and I don't know of a word in all of the plan of salvation that's more misunderstood than repentance. Time after time after time when someone says, TJ, I want to be baptized, let's, and I say, let's talk about it. And sooner or later I ask the question, do you know what repentance means? And, and more often than not, people say, well, it means that you're sorry. Or it means that you feel bad for what you've done. And, and I believe that most here this evening know that's not what the word repentance means. The word repentance means change your mind. And if our mind truly is changed, then obviously our actions will change. It's the idea that, that I'm heading down the road in this direction. Let's see if I've learned the area yet. I'm heading down 90 and I'm heading toward Publix and I change my mind and I say, nope, I don't want to go to Publix. I want to go to Walmart. And when I'm almost at Publix, I do a U-turn. Hopefully that's legal on that road. I don't know. And I head back the other direction. Brothers and sisters, when I'm living in sin, I'm serving self, sin, and Satan. I'm heading down a direction that leads ultimately to eternal destruction. And at the moment I repent, I say, I'm no longer going to serve self, sin, and Satan. I'm now going to serve the Savior. And wait a minute, in order to do that, I need to make a U-turn. I need to head back the other direction and go on a new path that leads to life. And I cannot be baptized unless I first repented of my sins. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38. They cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so repentance is a step that must be taken. Confession is something we don't emphasize a lot, but in the first century, when I could be thrown in jail or in prison or my life be taken, if I outwardly with my words pronounce the name of Jesus, it was very significant. And yet Paul, knowing he could have been thrown in jail or in prison, he still said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. If Paul could say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ in a time when he could be beaten or killed or imprisoned because of that confession, surely when I go to school tomorrow or when I go to work tomorrow or when I'm hanging out with the guys after work, surely I'm not afraid to live out my faith and bring others to Christ. To Christ. We must be willing to confess.
And oftentimes when someone I know is ready and someone needs that further convincing, I will often just point here as I draw this out. Our translators in Latin America, every study we do is almost exactly what you see on the screen. And by the time the week's through, they can teach it better than I can because they, I, I will write it out, they will write it out in Spanish and give it to the next one. And I will tell you this, folks, that oftentimes people need that extra nudge. And, and I would just ask you this evening, if you're here or someone listening... And you, free, you understand that we've all committed sin, therefore we're outside of the realm of the safety of God. We're outside of Christ as opposed to being inside of Christ. And as long as we remain outside of Christ, I cannot enjoy the spiritual blessings that only come in Christ. That is, redemption and grace and salvation and no condemnation. And there's many others. Uh, Ephesians 1 goes on to talk about an adoption and an inheritance that we have in Christ. And there's many more we could mention. I've got to tell you, folks, if, if you are here this evening or listening this evening and it's clear to you that you're not in Christ, I ask you this question, don't you want to be in Christ? If you at one time were in Christ, but because of the temptations all around us, you've been persuaded to leave Christ and you're no longer there receiving those spiritual blessings, I ask you again, don't you want to be in Christ? And most of the time when I ask that question in one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, nine out of ten times the person says, absolutely yes. The reason I told you this morning that I asked someone what their religious background is and what they did to be saved is because oftentimes someone will start the conversation by saying, well, I was saved in 1982 and I prayed and asked the Lord to come into my heart. And I will ask, well, so the moment in which you were saved is when you prayed. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, preacher, that's what I'm telling you. I'll turn the paper over, make a short note. And later in the study, almost on every occasion, they say, no, no, wait a minute, I was saved at baptism. Well, you can turn the paper over and say, that isn't what you told me earlier. I'm not here to win an argument, not here to win a debate, not here to do anything, but see that you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you willing this evening to have faith in Jesus as, the, as, as our Lord and Savior? Everyone I've met who doesn't identify as an atheist or agnostic says, absolutely. Are you then willing to, to do your best to, to change your mind and say, I'm going to try to live more to please God and less to please myself? Are you willing to do that? Most people will say yes. Some people will say, I, I, I need to get to that point, but I'm not ready. Are you willing with your words just to say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God so that people know definitively what's in your heart? Almost everyone I ask says, yes, I'm ready to do that. If I've taken step one and I've taken step two and I've taken step three, what in the world would stop me from taking that final step? Now, I've baptized a lady once who had a dreadful fear of water. And I finally convinced her that she needs to overcome that fear for something bigger and to be baptized. And she wanted to, but she had a legitimate fear. And I don't know what convinced her to do this, but on the day of her baptism, she put on the biggest, longest artificial nails I've ever seen. And I went to dunk her in that water. She gripped onto my head and face like a cat. And it took a lot of convincing. Some people have a legitimate fear. When I was preaching in South Carolina, there was a lady. We got a call. There was a lady dying of cancer, and she had days left to live. And she was a tiny, tiny woman at this point. She was literally hours or days left of her life. And when we, when we went over to her house, she was not able to make it to the church building, and we sat in her front yard and studied the Bible. And we studied and we read and we studied and we read and we interacted with her and she finally, I asked her, she was not able to do a lot of speaking, but she definitely was understanding what was taking place. And I said to her, oh, do you want to comply with what God's words told us to do here? Do you want to be baptized? She said, I do. We said, we went through these steps, do you truly believe? Are you willing to repent and confess? And she absolutely was. But she was too unhealthy to leave the premises of her home. We couldn't get her to the church building. They were, they were literally afraid that the car ride to the church building could possibly be the difference between life and death for her. 
Now they were somewhat impoverished family, had one small bathroom in their small house and it was the tiniest bathtub I had ever seen. But I said, if you want to, go and fill the bathtub up. Get it the temperature she likes and fill it up to the brim. And when we laid that lady there in that tiny tub, it was apparent to me that it looked nearly impossible to get her under this water. If we tried to push the knees in, the head couldn't go down. If we tried to push the shoulders and head down, the knees would pop up. And, and I said, you tell me when to stop. We don't want to hurt you. We don't want to do anything that's uncomfortable for you. And she kept persisting, no, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. The Bible says it. I've got to do it. I've got to be right with God. If this is the last day I live, I've got to be right with God. And this, it was uncomfortable to see and especially for my hands to be the one doing it. But I heard her body pop. She cried and she moaned. And we kept at every stage, are you sure we can find another way of doing this? She says, no, make it happen. And after some agonizing minutes and very uncomfortable minutes, we were finally able to baptize her. And folks, I'll tell you that it's probably not going to be that difficult for someone listening. It was difficult. It was painful for her to be baptized on that day. But she understood the significance of it. And she understood that it was the difference from being outside of Christ to being inside of Christ. If you're here this evening and need to be baptized and added to the body of Christ, if, if you know of someone who does, if you're listening and this is something that you would like to study with us further on, let me just say that all we're trying to do is go to heaven and take as many people to heaven as we can. And if you have that need to obey the gospel, if you're outside of Christ and want to now be in Christ where all spiritual blessings are found and be added to the body of Christ... We invite you to come and do that this very day as we stand and as we sing. For the